Hello, this is Mike from Victory's Art. Now, um, something I want to get off my chest a little bit, really. I've seen a lot of Facebook posts, well, social media posts in general from artists and creatives and people who run creative businesses, all understandably frustrated and concerned um, and sounding off about the fact that there are a number of economic trajectories outside their control that are affecting their business. At the moment, uh, business costs are increasing quite substantially. We're in the UK, but I'm sure this applies to probably a lot of other places in the world. Um, the cost of running a business is, is increasing. Uh, the costs of running your household at home are increasing, so you need to draw more income from your business to cover that just at the same time that those same economic pressures, the cost of living increases, cost of fuel, all that kind of thing, are impacting on the disposable income that our customers have to spend on things that, strictly speaking, they don't really need. Now, we could argue that everybody really needs some art and beautiful handmade things in their life, but when the crunch is in, of course, people are naturally going to prioritise their discretionary spending on things that they, they need to have, things that they need to replace, um, things that they need to wear, shoes for the kids, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're going to prioritise those things over the sort of expenditure that creatives and gallery owners and business owners and workshop leaders like us um, all rely on. Now. Some of the posts, actually quite a lot of the posts I've seen, and this is, this is why I've decided to record this video, a lot of those posts are really quite public, sort of laundry airing, and I'm really not sure that's the right way to go. Quite a lot of the people that see those posts could well be potential or indeed actual or past customers, and I'm not sure telling your potential or current customers that you're struggling a bit and sounding off about things that are completely outside your control um, is really a very positive kind of message to send. Okay, everybody knows that we're all finding it harder to make a living these days. Probably the majority of any population in any civilised country is probably finding those same economic pressures. But telling people quite so nakedly that you're struggling and that you're thinking of giving up and you might go out of business not really a very good thing to do in my opinion you remember there's there's a, a time in every economic cycle where hotel chains and um, holiday companies and so on talk about how difficult it is and they start making redundancies and cutting their staff and things like that and of course the natural effect of that is Potential customers for those businesses think, oh, crikey, if I spend my money with them, will I actually get my holiday or my flight or my hotel room or whatever? Maybe I'll actually book with somebody else who seems to be a little bit more secure. So I think to a certain extent that could then become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You tell people that you're struggling and you're thinking of, of probably maybe packing up the workshops or packing up your business or something. People who might have bought something from you are quite likely to then just buy from somebody else or, not, or certainly not buy from you anyway. So in which case, you then don't have that business that you could well have had. Remember, a lot of the people that will follow your social media channels are people who like what you do, they've already bought from you or they imagine that they would like to buy from you. Of course, this underlines the importance of keeping your, your personal social media channels very separate from your business media channels. If you have a business media channel, you're using that to communicate what your business does, to, to, to gather back interaction and feedback from your potential and actual customers and the people who admire what you do, the people who like your art or your craft or who enjoy your workshops. Keep those things separate. Air your, air your linen on your private channels, your personal channels if you must. Um, but keep your business channels positive and forward-looking. So, okay, so that's, that's one thing that I'm kind of quite aware of, really. And certainly at Vitrious Art, we always really do try to look for some positives there. Now, there's a couple of other things. Firstly, uh, and it, we've, we've survived quite a few recessions now, um, 
And something that remains true every time is that people who are quite well off tend to be vastly less affected, in fact quite often benefit, from a recession, from a tightening of general, general public finances, if you like. Whereas people who are less well off, they tend to be the ones who are most affected. Now, of course, it's entirely possible that you have a lot of customers for your craft business, your creative business, your, your personal art activity, who are in the latter group. They, those people that you have been quite happily making art for or teaching workshops to may well be feeling the pinch. And of course, their, their choice of how they spend their money is going to be different now and that could well continue to be the case for quite some time. What can you do to make your business more attractive, make your art or your craft or your workshops or your business more attractive to people who have money and are less affected? So that's something, that's a, that's a positive thing, that's, a, that's an affirmative move you can make. Now, I don't necessarily claim to have all the answers. You know, if I had all the answers, I'd be selling you something. Um, and I'm not selling you anything. That's something to know. Um, so what can you do to make your craft or your art or your gift business or your workshop art class business more attractive to people that still have money and still have discretion over how they spend their money? So, for instance, can you change the packaging of your product to increase the perceived value, make it seem a bit more precious and a little bit more giveable. Because actually, um, it's, it's fairly established, you know, a thing that even people who don't have as much money as they used to and are conscious of that fact, will still give gifts to other people. They'll still want to treat other people that are significant to them and not just at Christmas, you know, there are lots of, lots of times during the year when gift giving is quite a traditional thing to do. And of course, there's 365 days in the year and there's, there's birthdays on every, every single one of those days. Now, they are slanted more, there are more birthdays in, in August, September and November and December than there are the rest of the year. Um, for reasons which we don't need to dwell on right now, just have a, th have a little bit of a think about why that might be. Um, but there are still people who want to give presents to other, other people that they know and love and respect and think would like what you do, whether it's a workshop or a piece of art or creating a craft of some type. So what can you do to make your, your activities more giveable? If you don't already offer vouchers, then maybe you should. If you don't already offer experiences that are designed to be given as gifts, then maybe you should. Um, and then that other thing about perceived value. What can you do to increase your perceived value um, in order to make what you do more attractive to people who have money and still have money and who are used to buying finer, nicer, more polished and more finely presented things? Because that's one of the things that really separates high-end goods from lower end goods, not necessarily just the quality of the product. You're probably making really nice things. Are you presenting them as well as you could be? Is there an opportunity to create a lower end range with similar goods, but slightly plainer, more basic packaging and a higher end type of the same sort of thing with much nicer packaging, more giveable packaging perhaps? You know that perceived value is as much down to your reputation and how you present the products online um, and where you present the products online and how you conduct yourself. I mean, you know, the personal brand thing, you know, it's not what you say you do, it's how you are, it's what you actually do. So can you tweak your brand upwards in price scale a little bit to make it more attractive to people that still have money? Can you tune up your photography? Can you make your website look a bit smarter? Can you make your products look more precious and more giveable? So there's a couple of, a couple of thoughts there. Now, a really significant part of our business here is running art and craft workshops. That's what we started out doing. And actually, if truth be told, don't tell anyone, um, if I could just do that, 
I'd love to. And if I could just do that without having to charge people because I magicked into some money somehow, maybe found it at the end of the, uh, of the rainbow, then I, that's what I would do. However, I need, to make a, I need to make a living from running the workshops that Jenny and I provide. And what we're doing is we are tackling at it, tackling it from both ends. Number one is we are working to increase the perceived value of what we do. We're emphasizing the experience that we provide. We're emphasizing the fact that our class sizes are still way smaller than most other providers and that we have a big spacious studio where everyone's at least two meters apart from the other people on the same workshop. We're emphasizing the comfort and the fact that our workshop is not some sort of drafty village hall. It's not a garden room in somebody's, somebody's back garden. You know, it's a proper designed workspace that is intended for running comfortable, safe, well-equipped workshops. So we're emphasizing that. We've got some fantastic feedback on our feedback forms, which we always give to students after they've done a workshop. Wonderful, wonderful comments about how much people enjoyed the workshops, how much they felt comfortable and at ease, and how much they, they felt that the workshop was, a, was an experience that they'll remember for a long time. So, can you capitalise on that kind of feedback? Can you capitalise on the fact that you're doing a brilliant job providing experiences to people that they remember for a long time? Can you use those testimonials? Can you somehow derive some, some, some uplifting value from those comments, from that feedback that you're getting from your customers that will make more people who are quite discerning want to come on your workshops? That's what we're doing. Um, now, of course, we're also having to manage our costs and we are thinking about ways of continuing to provide the same high quality workshop environment and the same friendly and not too pressured uh, approach. But at the same time, we're looking for ways that we can just manage the costs a little bit. So, for example, a lot of glass fuses out there, and I know quite a few of them follow us on, on our social media channels because we, that's, that's one of the main things that we do in the workshop studio. Um, we are introducing more new half-day workshops where people can still have the pleasure of making something they'll enjoy owning. They can have the learning experience of discovering what glass fusing is all about and what the kiln does and all that sort of thing. Um, but those half-day workshops, we can run some in the morning, some in the afternoon, and it means we don't have to charge nearly so much for each of those class places. And in fact, because the half-day workshops don't have to require lunch as well, we can probably accommodate five or six people on each of those workshops with the same two-metre spacing because we don't have to accommodate lunch tables in between as well. So we're running more of those workshops so that people who are on a tighter budget or perhaps would like to spend the money on a whole day or a weekend course, but want to get a foot in the water, toe in the water, and know that they're spending the money wisely. They can have a try, have a play, see if they like the cut of our jib, see if they like the, the, the environment that we're working in, and see if, they, see if they like the sort of things that they've been making. So we're doing that. So could you introduce different kinds of workshops that will appeal to people who are on a tighter budget. Could you also, at the same time though, work on developing the perceived value of your higher priced workshop so that the sorts of people that have that sort of money to spend will feel reassured that you will take care of them, that they'll have a life changing or a life enhancing experience on your workshop. Can you do those things? Can you, again, thinking about perceived value, can you improve the presentation of your workshops online, on your social media channels? Can you make them seem a bit glossier and a bit more exciting? Can you use the customer feedback and the testimonials to drive up the perceived value and the desirability of your workshops? I'm just gonna to touch the phone, I've got a low battery alert. So going a little bit beyond that, are there other things that you can do to sell your classes a little bit more, sell your craft goods a little bit more? Now we know that a lot of people are, are bemoaning the fact that they do craft fairs these days and there aren't as many visitors and those visitors that do go don't spend as much. What can you do 
to provide goods that will appeal to people who are on a tighter budget? What can you do to sell those goods, put them in front of people at different venues other than physical venues? Can you run your online workshops instead of in-person workshops and therefore provide some of those workshops at a lower cost perhaps? That's something which we're actively working on. We've had inquiries from all over the world saying, I'd love to come on your workshops, but I live in a completely different continent. Well, obviously they're not gonna travel across the ocean in order to come to a workshop. A lot of people have pivoted very successfully during lockdowns and pandemic to providing online workshops. And the reason we haven't really is because it's always been our belief, and I think possibly on reflection mistakenly, that the cost of a kit of tools for doing stained glass, which you do a lot of, or the cost of a kiln, which we do also a lot of, would be a barrier. But actually it turns out there are lots of people out there with stained glass equipment and tools. There are lots of people out there with kilns, albeit possibly quite small kilns. So, so we are developing online workshops, making projects that are well away from the sort of things that you'd make with most online tutorials, but designed to fit the size of the most common um, plug-in kiln, for example, which is a Scup Firebox 14. Um, it's got a kiln shelf of about 30 something centimetres. So we are developing interesting fusing projects that we can teach online that will fit in one of those kilns. Could you do something like that? Could you pivot a little bit to make your online offer more attractive, more affordable and less dependent on your physical workspace? Because we know a lot of people have downsized their physical workspaces because of costs. Um, how about doing that? Can you add value to your workshops? For instance, we provide info packs and follow-on support for people who attend workshops and they want to do some at home and they're a bit unsure about, you know, do I, what kind of kiln do I want? How do I get it going? How do I make sure my firings are successful? Yeah, how do I set up my stained glass studio? We provide ongoing support for people like that and we sell that, we, we, we communicate that as part of what you are buying when you pay for a course with us. What is the longer term value? Because, you know, you know this, somebody who buys something from you once, and this is the same for art and craft goods and workshops and actually any kind of business. Somebody who buys something from you once is highly likely to buy from you again if they enjoy the experience of buying it and they enjoy the experience of owning whatever it is that they've bought from you. So, can you provide some tangible, physical, longer term value for somebody investing their money with you on a workshop? Can you provide some sense of community or some sense of having bought something that's a bit special if it's craft or a piece of art that you're selling? So that kind of comes back to marketing. If you know, and this is a, an established fact that people who bought something from you once will buy again much more likely. And of course the marketing cost of reaching those people and putting putting new ideas into their head for things they might want is much lower than acquiring new customers. So are you marketing to your existing customer base effectively? You have your email list, I hope. If you haven't, now is the time to really get into that kind of stuff. You're building up your social media following and your channels. Um, what can you do to emphasize the newness of what you're doing and to keep coming back for new things and at the same time, provide them with an ongoing sense of ownership of something a bit special. Can you make what you're selling or providing or teaching feel like something they will treasure for such a long time that A, they will tell other people about it because that's a brilliant marketing word about it, and B, will be quite inclined to prioritise spending money with you again over other things. Yeah. Okay, I doubt that somebody who is really tight for money at the moment is likely to say, well, actually, I'm just going to save up money every month so I can go on another workshop or so I can buy another fantastic piece of fused glass art from you or another brilliant painting or something. They might not do that, but there will be people who are perhaps a little bit feeling a little bit more comfortable but still nervous about their financial situation. You might think, well, actually, that's a really good way of 
helping to care for oneself, to, 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 to invest in mental well-being by taking art and craft workshops or by supporting other artists, that sort of thing. So can you reach those people more effectively? Where do they hang out? Where, which are their social media channels? Where do they physically go? Which magazines and online channels do they spend time looking through and paying attention to? Can you identify the people who already have bought with you? Can you identify the people who are likely to be your evangelists, your amb ambassadors? And certainly we know, we know them pretty well. We've got quite a few customers who keep coming back. Now, I'm fairly sure uh, most of them are pretty well healed. That's, that's certainly true. Um, but I'm fairly sure that they also are feeling the pinch a little bit. That may well change their buying decisions. It may well change how they feel about the sort of money that they might be spending. Um, what can we do to, to make them feel that that money if, uh, uh, is more of an investment than a cost, an investment in themselves, an investment in their home to make it look more, more beautiful, an investment in their local creative economy as well? Because actually quite a lot of people would like to support artists and creatives and crafters and art workshop providers, quite a lot of people would like to support you. Just don't make them feel like you're begging them to. Make them feel like you're giving them something. I am helping you to enjoy your life more in return for the money that you spend with me. Not a, please give me more, please give me some money because otherwise I'm gonna go out of business. I don't think that's gonna work. You know, begging, begging other people for something if you're not giving them something doesn't really work. Um, you know, emotional blackmail is not, a, is not a comfortable thing. And the sort of people who have money to spend um, on non-essential purchases aren't really likely psychologically to respond very well to that. They might well get quite turned off by that. I certainly know that I've dealt with quite a few art businesses who over the last year or two have gone from being really sharing and friendly and caring and keen to share knowledge and expertise to being quite insular and inward looking and a bit worried about their business and not really all that focused on their customer base. They're sending out kind of like the wrong signals. It's kind of like a reverse pheromone, if you like. So I would really recommend not doing that. Yeah, be positive. Okay, I think we also should be pragmatic and realistic Nobody wants to be told, hey, everything's brilliant, when they obviously know it's not. But there must be a more healthy and forward-looking and affirming colour, a gloss that we can put on things. Not, not, not lying about how brilliant things are. You know, whenever you see a business, you know, maybe you, you bump into somebody you were at school with and you say, hey, how are you doing? And they say, oh, I am doing fantastically. I can't believe how brilliantly I'm doing it. And you can see that they've got scuffed shoes and you just saw them get out of a really dirty old car and you know that they're, they're not the millionaires, they're, they're wanting you to think they are. People who are into art, who value art, aren't at as easily kidded, uh, they're not as easily fooled as, as, as you might think. Those, those collectors of art, you think, well, you could sell any, any childish school to them. Probably not, actually. What they want, what they will be happy to exchange money for is something which they value. What do they value? That's the, the job of the art or craft or education marketer is to try and understand what their potential and actual and future customers really want and provide it to them on a profitable basis. You know the old, the old de definition of marketing before it all got very complicated? The management process of, of anticipating and identifying and providing goods or services that the customer base really wants on a profitable basis. That sort of, that sort of thing. I think I may have slightly paraphrased that. Anyway, um, what can you do, what can I do in my own business to, to more effectively market to my customers, to more effectively communicate the value of what they would be buying if they prioritise their expenditure with me rather than just going buy another pair of shoes. Okay, um, there's more to this really. 
um, than I can really cover in a 20 minute video. And I think a lot of it is messaging, identifying the right people to communicate with and making sure that the perceived value of your offer, whatever it is, a physical service or a product or a handmade item of some sort, making sure the perceived value of that is going to appeal to the sort of people that are more likely to be your customers, perhaps at the expense of people who really aren't likely to be your customers. Now, my final point though is that everything goes in cycles, you know that as well. Um, you don't really want to alienate people who can't afford what you do today and who might be able to afford what you do in a year's time. So this is, this is why your ongoing marketing is really important. What can you share with those people that will maintain the connection, make them feel like you value what they do and their previous support? Because I hope you do value that. What can you do to, to keep them engaged and excited about what you do so that when they are in a position to come and do your art workshop or buy a piece of your art, they will do. And they won't have forgotten about you or they won't have felt that you've forgotten about them. Okay, so that was my final shot. Now I've got to try and remember where I put my little shutter control. Here we are. So I'm gonna wish you a happy weekend or week, whichever, and hope that there's been something in this video of, of use to you and I'd love it if you left me a comment or like the video preferably and subscribe to this channel uh, because I've got plenty of other videos, plenty of other things that I hope might be useful to you. In the meantime, so long for now. Thanks for watching.